Warning, the following program has been rated T for truth. You can't handle the truth! Oh, we think you can. Welcome to the Naked Truth Report with your host, truth warrior and myth buster, Kathleen Wells. The place where we distinguish fact from fiction, where data is used to drive points home, and where Kathleen takes the position that Democrats and black politicians have destroyed black America. Welcome to the Naked Truth Report. Now, your host, Kathleen Wells. Ah, uh, welcome, welcome, welcome to the Naked Truth Report. It's me, Kathleen Wells, your host of the Naked Truth Report. And I have a guest. Yeah, I have my in-studio VIP guest today. But I'm not going to bring her on yet because there's a few things I want to discuss first. Yeah, you know, I want to discuss what? Let's see, Amarosa had a book. Woodward has a book. Uh, Obama comes up, comes in and takes credit for the economy. And what's number four? The New York Times. Pen, right, not writes, but publishes an op-ed from a supposedly, air quotes, supposedly senior White House, White House official. I mean, you know, are the Democrats desperate or what? Are the Democrats desperate or what? In fact, Paul Craig Roberts wrote an article. You can go to paulcraigroberts.org. And the article is titled, I know who the senior official is who wrote the New York Times op-ed. It's at paulcraigroberts.org. I mean, I think it's, you know, when you read that piece, when you read that op-ed piece, one of the things they, that they come out with is the fact that, uh, let's see, President Trump, he said the, um, the media, the press, was the enemy of the American people. Well, I mean, that kind of like tells you who wrote it right there. <laughs> because, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, because the issue is why would a senior White House official be concerned with the fact that, the, that Trump bashed the media? That would be the last thing they would be talking about, I would think. I think they would be talking about the fact because they're concerned with foreign policy and all that stuff. They would be talking about the fact that, you know, Trump is bashing what? The DOJ or the FBI. But they would not be concerned about the media necessarily, right? Right. But they put that quote in there exactly. They put the quote in there exactly. Oh, President Trump said that the pub press is, the, they put it like a standalone sentence. That sentence was in one paragraph. President Trump said that the press is the enemy of the American people. That sentence is in one paragraph. So that means that it is so relevant, it is so important, it is so profound, it is so significant to the person who wrote this op-ed piece, right? It's up there high priority. And so, you know, I want folks to read this Paul Craig Roberts piece. Dot or Paul, go to paulcraigroberts.org. I know who the senior official who wrote the New York Times op-ed piece. Please go and check it out. He says the New York Times wrote it. Because all of the things that they're concerned with, concerned with all of their focus is on unsubstantiated assertions, unsubstantiated statements that the New York Times has made. I mean, it is so obvious. It is so obvious to the, to the casual observer, or, or should I say the reasonable <laughs> critical thinker, to the reasonable logical person, to the reasonable person that took, you know, I took logic in college. Did you? Did you take, I'm going to, I can't help but bring my guest on because she's <laughs> laughing at me. She's, she's laughing at me. She has a big smile on her face. She's my VIP in-house studio guest. Her name is Jenny San. Thank you, Jenny, for joining me on the Naked Truth Report. It is such a pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm absolutely thrilled. I'm a big fan of you, so um, it was a real honor. Thank you. I appreciate it. And you also, you attended the uh, Dinesh D'Souza panel, post-screening panel discussion with my four black American men, right? I did. And I was, I was actually invited to several screenings and I wanted to come to that one specifically to yours because I thought this is the person, this is the person, A, this is the group that this, that this movie was really made for on their behalf. And this is the group that has been literally persecuted by the Democrat party uh, for centuries. And they, the, 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 everything that comes out of their mouth is projection 
So every time they call us racists and bigots, we know who the real racists and bigots are. They talk about wanting to get rid of gun control. Well, where did gun control come from? It came from them mm -hmm. to keep guns out of the hands of the uppity new freed blacks who yeah. are all you know voting Republican and running as Republicans. And everything that they have done is basically to keep uh, to keep, as Candace Owens talks about, and as you talk about, is to keep uh, people dependent, to keep people uh, ignorant, to keep black, them un to uninformed. Keep black Americans specifically. So, you know, Jenny, Jenny knows what she's talking about. And the issue is that more black Americans need to know context, need to know history, and need to know data. You cannot consider yourself a political analyst. You cannot consider yourself analyzing the politics if you're name calling. Name calling, you know, I called into C-SPAN or Washington Journal and said that. Name calling is not political analysis. <laughs> Labeling people, I don't care what the label is. You know, where do Democrats get off thinking <laughs> that if you don't like someone's personality, that is political analysis? And that's what that New York Times op-ed piece is about. It's saying he's good, you know, Trump is good with the economy, he's good with um, foreign policy things, the economy is roaring, blah, 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 blah. But his personality is bad. We don't like his personality. Where do people get off thinking that not liking someone's personality is political analysis? And exactly, I want to look at what exactly they said in the piece. I underlined it. It says, <clears throat> uh, he has misguided impulses. Who, who? What is what is what exactly is a, what exactly is misguided impulses? Are your impulses misguided if you've got the economy roaring? Is that is that a misguided impulse? But the, this is the other thing that I want to say is that you know we all listen. We all do. We all get along. Do we all get along? We all have different personalities, right? That's and that's some of the that's like what astrology looks like. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we have like 12 different astrological signs, you know? Right. I remember getting this big red book, and it would even have it like divided, like, I can't even, it was like Aries 1, Aries right. 2, Aries 3, Aries 2. Remember the, love signs? I know! It's love like, signs. You know, we spend so much energy, at least our generation, the right. big baby boomers, on astrology. And the whole thing with astrology is that you don't get along with every person, everybody's personality. I know I really don't get along with what? Gemini's. Right? <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? And so it's like Democrats are telling us we don't like his personality and therefore we should impeach him. How is that reasonable? Right? I hate to say it. I really hate to say it. But it's a very emotional thing. And there is a certain, certain part of the public <laughs> you know, that kind of bases all their, you know, bases their decisions based on emotions. And some of, those, some of those are young people. Young people basically base them on emotions. But an overwhelmingly, unfortunately, it's, it's women. And that's what's, what's been, you know, we, we, were, we were in the forefront of the, of the feminist movement. And like every other movement, it was, it, there was some serious you know, questions at the time and, and challenges that we need to overcome or whatever. Um, but, but then every single movement since the civil rights movement, has been compared to the civil rights movement. Nothing compares to the civil rights movement. That's absolutely Nothing. right. That's absolutely. I love you saying that. Uh, you put it better it's than a, not. It's so you, abhorrent to me that the gay rights, the women, everybody, you know, compares themselves to the plight of blacks. No, I'm sorry, you don't get to do that. Right. It's not the same. It's not the same. It's not. And you know, Ann Coulter even said that. Right. And this is why. This is why. Oh, I'm oh that reminds me. What? When I called, <laughs> I, I, I haven't thought about this in years. I had a business uh, delivering, you know, things to people, <laughs> and I had some pretty serious clients. And I remember uh, Ann Coulter had come out. Uh, it was it was again some some principle that that the women overwhelmingly voted for. It was some some policy or whatever that women overwhelmingly voted for. It was so incredibly stupid, mm -hmm. and she really said that you know women women really <laughs> should give up the right to vote. I mean, because this is if this is what we do, if this is how stupid we are. And I called up Larry Elder. He was talking about this, and I said I totally I couldn't agree with her more. I lost about five clients that day. 
you know, well, you know and I always say, I said, listen, hon, if dinner, depressing. if black folks are going to continue to uh, vote Democrat, yeah, the suppress their votes. Uh, suppress their vote. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Do you think our ancestors, our relatives, our ancestors that fought for the right to vote, do you think they wanted us voting for our own demise? <laughs> it's okay. suicide, yeah. Yeah. Your do you suicide. think our ancestors, I think our ancestors would prefer that we not vote as opposed to vote for our own demise. We have been decimated. In fact, last week I played, or the week before, I played LBJ's commencement speech in 1965 uh, with before Howard University. Devastating, yeah. And he said that we had 66% two-parent families in 1965. Another data point that he said, LBJ said this, he said in 1965, college-educated black women made more money than college-educated white women, okay? See, black people need to get informed. My people, my people need to get informed. If you're going to vote Democrat, my position is this. Black folks, if you're going to vote Democrat, yes, I prefer your vote be suppressed. Yes, I prefer that you not vote if you're going to vote Democrat. We have been destroyed by this party. I well, say it and, all and the you've time. also been destroyed by the illegal, illegal immigration and the issue that has basically been, you know, destroying the jobs and destroying the job market. And, you know, and then you have the, the welfare that the LBJ uh, issued in and the welfare system that basically replaced the fathers in the home with Uncle Sam. And I literally had someone who used my address, who used to work for me, and a young black man, a very bright guy, and he, he lived with his, his, uh, the mother of his daughter, and he had to use my address because she couldn't get aid which she really needed, and she was a Nigerian uh, uh, immigrant, and she really needed, and she couldn't get it if he was living at home with his, ch with his child. So they basically said, to, it, to me, that's the most evil thing that, in my lifetime they did was basically incentivize the breakup of the black family. That's evil. And that's evil, that's diabolical, because LBJ pretended that he was interested, <laughs> pretended that he was concerned back in 1965. Well, you know the great quote. What is the great? We'll oh have, yeah, we'll have oh, these n words voting for us for you know two hundred years. Two hundred years. You know, black centuries. Americans, you gotta He's wake right, up. Too. Let me tell you something. You folks gotta wake up. I'm not kidding. I want your. You know, I'm gonna come out and say publicly, I want Black Americans' votes uh, suppressed if you continue to vote Democrat. Uh, that's one of the things that we wanted to talk about. But another thing that I wanted to talk about, Jenny, is your Connect the Dots organization. Can you? Can you? Clue my truth warriors in as to what that is, connect the dots. Well, I'll tell you what started initially is I, I came from a district uh, that was having a special election for an open assembly seat. And a wonderful uh, candidate, we had a wonderful candidate running as a, a rather moderate Republican. She was pretty moderate on social issues, but very conservative on, uh, you know, on fiscal issues. Her name was Susan Shelley. And she was absolutely terrific, and she's about 5'2", and her, 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 her opponent, her Democrat opponent, was about 6'5", and it was just, it, but she wiped the floor with him in the debate. She was so terrific, and she got no help from the party, and very little help from any of, uh, any of us had this ragtag group of people. Okay, so when Election Day rolls around, out of 28,000 votes, she lost by a grand total of 329 votes, and here's the kicker, Kathleen. 55,000 Republicans in my district didn't bother to vote. 55,000, if we'd just gotten 1% of them to actually go and check off that box, she would be in Sacramento today. So I, I was so furious about this, and I thought, never again. This is, this is obscene. And so I formed a, a nonprofit called Connect the Dots because, for three reasons. One, I felt like we desperately needed the people on our side. We have so many groups like the Women's Federated Groups and the College Republicans and the Turning Point and the Tea Party Groups, and there's a zillion of them. And they don't have any coordination or focus or, or connection whatsoever, unlike the Democrats that have the unions, those are the big ones, and they have the whole party and they have all the George Soros' groups and whatever, but they're all pretty much on the same page. We never have been, so I thought, A, we have to fix that. Secondly, right now, we needed to kind of really focus on the issues and now the elections, the races, 
that we need to focus on those because we have millions of volunteers and donors in this state. There's a million registered Republicans in LA County alone, a million. But we have to get to them and we have to get them to vote and they have to know who to vote for and, and how, to get, how to get involved. And then thirdly, I think we desperately needed to fix our messaging, which to quote Charlie Kirk at Turning Point, sucks. Uh, we And we're constantly talking about the issues and the Second Amendment and the First Amendment and the Founding Fathers and the Constitution. And obviously, I love all those things. However, it doesn't affect anyone who's not already on our side. We needed to talk to the young people. We needed to talk to the kind of states. We needed to figure out a way into, you know, letting them open up their minds and open up their hearts or whatever. And we didn't know how to do that. So I thought, to me, the first, the first, the first suggestion that I had was to stop talking. Stop talking, especially stop talking about the Constitution, the Founding Fathers, and all that, and start listening to people. Listening to people and finding out what their concerns are, what their problems well, you are. You know, I really just about. think that two things that should be the message. Democrats have destroyed black America, and being pro-illegal aliens is, uh, to, you, you're, Against no, you're against American citizens by being pro-illegal immigration. Exactly. Those are just exactly. the two messages right there. Right there. That's it. There's you know, so simplicity is the key to success. Excuse Keep it me? simple. Keep it simple. Right. Being pro-illegal aliens is anti-American. That's the message. And look what you're doing to the people who came here legally and who waited years and years and years and did it right and all the paperwork, right. you know, and the sponsors and everything to do it right and then just say these other people come in and say, oh, well, right. I guess they get to, you know, crowd in front of the line. I think that's the issue. And How you fair know, is that? And young people care about fairness and justice, justice. right? They care they about care fairness. They care about fairness. Yes. So you have to say things like that to them. How fair is that they get to crowd in front of the line? How fair is it that they have to go to these horrible they are sentenced to the worst public schools with the worst teachers in the country. But also you should say that you're anti-black if you are, because the data is clear. We have been discussing this since the 1800s. I, you know, my truth warriors out there know I say this. Marcus Garvey, Booker T. Washington, W.E. Du Bois, Frederick Douglass. For, they talked about high immigration's no adverse impact on black America. That's why we have 40%. Listen, this is something that Michael Medved says. We have, he says we have homelessness because these people are mentally ill. I don't think that's the case for every single homeless person. I think some of those homeless black folks in Los Angeles could use a construction job. I believe that. I don't think they're all mentally ill. No, absolutely not. <laughs> you know, I mean, too, too many of them are hooked on you know, drugs or drugs. alcohol, and some of them are mentally ill. But some but we of have, them We have incentivized them not working. Yeah, yeah. And we can't just do yet another jobs program. A federal no, no, or state no. jobs program does not work. So we've you tried have to that. kind of we've start with that. the root causes, right. which you've been talking about. Right, we've tried that. You know, the listen, Democrats have been talking about jobs for black men since day one. You might as well set that money on fire. I know. And this is another thing. What about Obama taking credit for the economy? <laughs> what do you think about that? Well, it was just, you know, it, it, it's, it's like Reagan. It, it's like uh, uh, um, President Clinton got the credit for the economy that, that, that Reagan was, was literally on the way up and booming. But it wasn't until, but also you have to remember that Clinton, the Clinton had a, a, a Republican Congress for most, most of his term. And they stopped him from from they, from raising taxes, and they stopped. They cut the welfare spending. They they made the uh, uh, work requirement for welfare, and that cut welfare in half. When all of a sudden you couldn't keep having babies, just getting more, having more more money by having more babies, you couldn't afford to afford to take care of, and you couldn't, you know, you you couldn't just. In fact, Nancy Pelosi's daughter did a documentary about this. Do you remember this a few years ago? Uh, there were a whole bunch of people lined up outside the welfare office in Manhattan, and um, there was a an employment office, which means employment office, where the job listings were, right next door. And Nancy Pelosi's daughter had this microphone and asked all of these people, and unfortunately there are too many, too many minorities in that line, wouldn't you, are you interested in going in there and seeing what the job, what job openings are? Not one. Because they're not living well, but... They're, 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 they're getting by doing nothing. No, but the, the whole thing has been screwed up because, first of all, I believe black men would marry black women 
if they had real wealth. This is about having real wealth, real opportunities. And so, you know, and I I blame my black leaders, these so-called Jesse Jacksons and Al Sharptons and oh gosh, you know, and I was listening on a YouTube video to Roland Martin and he had some black woman on and she was talking about, oh my God, this is what she said. Racism is rampant. It's like, you know, it's like seeping out of every nook and cranny. And this is what the media, see, the bizarre thing, listen, tell you. if racism is seeping out of every nook and cranny, why does the Democrats want to take our guns? So, you know, they're just an illogical party. These people cannot think properly. They cannot. They're not logical. But the thing I want to say is this. What was I talking about? Racism is not rampant. And I've discussed, if it were, you know, this is what I want to say. My grandfather was born in 1895. So you're, you know, Frederick Douglass would laugh at the black men today. Or or cry. Laugh or cry, yeah. And, you know, who is it that invited Booker T. Washington to, it was a Republican, I just heard this. A Republican president invited Booker T. Washington to the White House, and he was scoffed. Oh, Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt, right. Theodore Roosevelt invited, Republican Theodore Roosevelt invited Booker T. Washington to dinner at the White House, and the Democrats in the South were the only, because he won re-election, right? And the Democrats in the South used that to not vote for him the Democrats in the South. This is why I want to encourage folks to see the movie, Dinesh D'Souza's movie, Death of a Nation, because you need historical context, right? You need historical context. Anyway, oh, we've got two more minutes, and you know what we're going to do right now? What? (laughs) We're going to do, Jenny, we're going to do my um, Ronnie C. Wright minute. Oh, great. Are you ready for that? I'm ready. Are we ready for that? It's going to be fantastic. And when he, I've heard it before, and it's a fantastic thing. And I'm going to just go straight to it. And then we'll talk about it when we come back from the break. Let's play it. Thanks. The Ronnie C. Wright Minute. Thanks. This is the Ronnie C. Wright Minute. Thought-provoking political commentary brought to you by PromptJet. PromptJet.com. This week's Timeless Message Award for Faith, Freedom, Family, Focus, finance, and fitness goes to Reverend Jasper Williams of Atlanta, who delivered the eulogy for his lifelong friend, Aretha Franklin in Detroit. Summed up in one word, respect, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Realize every single person eternally counts today. This timeless truth will uplift Americans everywhere especially in the black community, seeking positive people and policies that make a major difference. Thank you, Reverend Williams. Back to you, Kathleen. (laughs) Ah, welcome back. Welcome back to the Naked Truth Report. I'm joined by my guest, Jenny Sand, my VIP in-house guest. Did Did you hear that Ronnie C. Wright minute? We love it, right? I mean, that was a good one, right? I think all of them are going to be a good one, but I particularly like this one because he's talking about what? Pastor Jasper Williams, who is the pastor that delivered the eulogy for Aretha Franklin. We're going to get him on the show. I'm not kidding. I love, I love that eulogy. And can you believe you had some black folks on social media that didn't like that eulogy of Pastor Jasper Williams? He talked about the necessity for daddies in the homes. He's dangerous. He's very dangerous to the left. He's very dangerous to the black community because what he did took such courage uh, that uh, you, you, don't, you don't see that nearly enough. But, and the fact that he didn't back down. But the, what, he, what he did in, 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 in that venue was absolutely extraordinary. Extraordinary. And the fact that you know, he was non-apologetic. And he basically just told the truth. It's, it's the, literally the theme of your show, telling the truth, and then to me, having the courage to say it where he did, and then and, and to, to back it up. And say, well, I'm I not mean, sorry. I'm not going to take it back. I'm right, sorry. right, right. It's because, you know, you know, Democrats or Republicans are – people usually have to apologize. They have, they're yellow, yellow belly. Yeah. They have to apologize for things that they do because the media applies so much pressure. But, you know, as far as I'm concerned, preachers, sh- preachers should be courageous. They're truth seekers, aren't they? They should be courageous. And then you have this Reverend Barber. 
who I think he's from South Carolina or North Carolina, he was saying, they are trying to say that what he said was wrong. That's right. These are what horrible yeah. people. These what are he's doing is he is defending and promoting the black family. He was talking about the wonderful black women. And the, 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 the yeoman job that they do that's so difficult working two and three jobs trying to raise these kids. But it, it's, again, why Jordan Peterson is the phenom that he is, Dr. Jordan Peterson, who's probably the most famous guy in the world right now. And basically, he's, he's saying the same thing. He says, men need they need role models, they need fathers, they need to grow up and accept their responsibilities in the home, in the family, in the communities, in the job places. That is their natural habitat. And it's he said, natural. They're nat and, and he said, if you don't do that, you cannot have decades and decades of all these rights without commensurate responsibilities. And that's something you, that you have never heard. And he said, the young men... Young young men of color and young men of don't of, call oh no uh, don't call us of color okay. call us black black American. black men yes. black men <laughs> uh, and, and and more more and more women now too but he said they have been in tears talking about this he has been literally counseling he is a, he's a lifelong liberal in Canada but he has been counseling conservative politicians telling advising them to start talking about responsibilities and I think we as as conservatives now must go after and reclaim all of these groups the blacks the Hispanics the the the, the men uh, the, the, the gays that, that are that are naturally our constituents. These are our people. Yes, 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 yes. Because the fifth, this is the thing. It's about you know manhood. You know this. I've had right. Judge Joe Brown on the show yeah. to talk about it. He talks about it excellently. Right. I'm going to yes, have him does. on again. Men, you know, you need men, Boys need their Yoda training <laughs> throughout civilization. Throughout yes. civilization, boys they have had rituals to becoming a man. This is something that you admire. This is something that is courageous. This is something that is no it is noble to be a man. And you have to go through the ritual and you get that ritual from your I can women cannot teach boys how to be a noble man. Right. I don't even know what nobility is, okay? And it's not so, that it's not possible. It's just so much harder. It's highly unlikely. There are I wonderful cannot, single it parents. It is impossible. I cannot mm -hmm. teach a boy how to be a noble man. I don't know what that is. Well, Ben Carson's mother was single mother, black, illiterate, poor, and she did the only thing when her husband left her and she found out he was a bigamist and he left her. She did the only thing she could think of to support her boys, which was clean, start cleaning houses for a living. And she noticed there were two things besides the obvious that were different in the houses she was cleaning versus the houses in her own neighborhood. And she said, number one, the kids weren't sitting around watching television all the time like in her neighborhood, and that's been that's when television was wholesome, like Mickey Mouse Club and Father Knows Best and you know, Rifleman. And number two, she said there were books everywhere in this yes, home she was you cleaning. Said, but, these, but Ben Carson's an exception. No, you no, see, no. His, he is, of course, he's an exception. But he's an exception because his mother was an exception. No, but because I mean, he's mother exceptional realized. intellectually. Okay. I'm talking about the no. average person. The average person will not grow to be a Ben Carson. I don't care how much they read or how disciplined their mother is. What is the average? You have exceptions to the rule. Right. Those are people it's who are above right. average in intellect, right. but most people are average. And so you cannot make print policies for the exception. That's true. You That's have to have policies true. for the majority of people, the average people. The majority of people are in the average cohort and the average grouping. And therefore, you have to have policies that impact that group, well, the largest amount right. of people. Exceptional people will basically always make it no matter the circumstances because that's their exceptionality, okay? They're above average in intellect. That's not the but average if, if person. You, but if you do not, if you do not give, the, if you do not give uh, the, the, a young boy, you, not only do you not give many fathers, and you don't give many de decent education, and then then you you don't you don't have a prayer of You're, that child. You, then he doesn't have a chance. Twenty five years ago, Christina Hoff Summers was on a, sh a show. C Tucker Carlson's father had asked uh, a friend of mine who co-founded Friends of Abe, Lionel Chetwin, to to do a, a, a when when William Buckley 
stopped doing his firing line show on NPR, he asked my friend to do a conservative uh, television show. And uh, they were talking about one of, one of the segments that he did was the war on boys. And he basically said they had they had all these wonderful people on, and Fred Barnes hosted it. And one of the one of the guests that he had on back then was Christina Hoff Summers. Mm -hmm. And there's a sad part: Christina Hoff Summers, 25 years ago, was talking about how oh, the yeah. boys don't have they yeah. don't have anybody in their corner. They don't have the fathers, you know, less and less even 25 years ago than now. And he she said they, they didn't have now or any of these you know thousands of groups that women have. And she, she said something that was heartbreaking. She said, well, at least they still have the Boy Scouts. And look what we are today. Listen, all these things have been going on for decades. The feminist movement was the big, the Immigration Act of 1965 was a big, big mistake. And the feminist movement was a big, big mistake. Do you want to take a call now, you think, Jenny? Sure. We've got calls. Absolutely. Let's see, what time are we at? So we heard the Ronnie C. Wright minute and we loved it. We, we love that Ronnie C. Wright minute about manhood. Uh, why don't we take a call about Jasper Williams and the family? That's what it was about. We need families, black families, white families, Latino families, Asian family. We need families, okay? Uh, black folks are at the bottom. We only have 25% two-parent families. So uh, let's take a call from uh, Bob in Palos Verde. Oh, hi, Bob. Hi, Bob. He was one of my hey. VIP guests. Hi, Bob. You were my VIP guest. My Hi, first Bob. one. My first one, actually. Happy to talk to you lovely ladies this evening. Hello, Bob. Good evening. And Jenny, God, what a great speaker. Oh. I would rather listen <laughs> to her you. than have me on. Would you no, have me no, on no, no, no. Or anyway, she's so much better. <laughs> no, she's no, not. But no, I remember being sure. a big fan of yours, too. So thank you for calling in. You two are so cool. I just love it. And, and you know, I, I know you don't. You only have a certain amount of time here, but we love it when it happens. And you know, you're, you're talking about how to help a black kid or any kid, for that matter, turn into a man and help them teach them. And we have some we have some good resources out there that can help them. There's there's a lot of interesting things that are available. When I got started in the like, I'm a Mason. All right, now, originally, Masons didn't work overly hard, um, you know, not all that proud to say, of bringing black men in. Then they found out, geez, these are just as good a people as white guys. You really, really are. And during the time I... Oh, gee, really? <laughs> I mean, you know how that sounds, Bob G. You know, and, and, and uh, all right, I'm from Virginia. I like that. Yeah, yeah, okay. And, and I've been there and done that and lost that T-shirt. But, you know, I'm a Mason in California which is a lot more, a lot easier to work with. But I've also done a lot of trips through the South, Mississippi, uh, Alabama, and like that. We spent a lot of time there. And the, the, the Masonic lodges teach men, uh, boys to become men, and that is one of those things. And black men are very much accepted now. There's also the concordant bodies that, have, that are out there, because if you knock on the door, they open and they talk to you and they bring you in. And so one of the things you might suggest, among the myriad of other things that you're doing, because you're, you, you are, uh, Kathleen, you, you are just so wonderfully adept at teaching the black boys to men that are listening to your show on how to do it. But they have to knock on the door of a Masonic Lodge. To be one, you have to ask one. And it's a creed. It's part of the credo. Um, we're not going to come at you but all of us will help you regardless of color and the black men are being highly welcomed now black boys coming into the into manhood that's one how do you promote the, this how do you promote the, well i mean i don't know if black men are going to want to go to a masonic lodge i mean to be honest well, with you guys it's, it's true i mean because that, that's where you gain a lot of a lot of background and that's not the only one by any means and that i can we can debate that right for, you know, all evening if you care to. Uh, I have the answers for that if you want to hear it, that's fine. But that's a beer and pretzels conversation, as I like to call it. Well, I would have to, I would like to ask black men to call in and tell me if they would like to be a part of the Masonic Lodge. A lot of them don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. and, and so if they want to know more about it, fine. I'm only too happy to help you elaborate on that. But I don't want to use up your remaining few milliseconds here. 
the there are lots of organizations out there. YMCA has done a lot for men, boys, you know, coming into manhood. And I know when I was 18, I was a rudderless ship. You don't want a rudderless ship, and that's kind of okay when you're 14, 15, 16. That's all right. But when you're by, by the time you're age 20, 21, you kind of better have an idea which direction north is, and and start to head that way. We have some very prominent black people these days. In 2014, it was a it was a watershed of black Republicans brought into the the Congress during the GOP landslide of that era there were so many of them and we've got we, we got uh alan west tim scott uh jc watts will hurt mia love these people are prominent they stand out they're uh, they're very statutory figures they 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 stand tall they stand proud they don't stoop and they they're a good and they're endangered of, too mia love and, especially. Yeah, yeah i wouldn't want to debate that with you but the reality here is there are sources on this. Kathleen, you're, you're so well-spoken. I wouldn't be able to contact somebody like that, but I'll bet you if you were to reach a little bit out to uh, some of them and say, hey, listen up, this is what we need. Because, yes, you're right about the, the male presence in the family needs to be there. And true, Obama never wasted one minute of his uh, lounging around in the White House time with his feet up on the desk trying to help the black community. Okay, thank you, Bob. Thanks. I thanks. I got a lot of phone calls. I appreciate you calling in. So why don't we take a call now from Tio in Los Angeles? Hi, Tio. You want to comment about Judge Joe uh, Brown? Hi. Yes, how are you? Good. Appreciate you taking my call. I was reaching out to see if there was a way that we could be put in contact with uh, Judge Joe Brown. We have an opportunity uh, to train trainees to get into the electrical industry, mm -hmm. and I would like to leave my website. And if and I would like for you to, if you could, go to the career tab, and you'll see that there's over 80 different jobs. Okay, why don't you I, give me the website address? Give it to me. Uh, w or well, D E I dash C A dot org okay what does that dea stand for dei uh Deruso electrical institute okay fantastic dei dash ca dot org and go to the contacts tab well the uh career tab career tab and i have a list of all the jobs we are this is a new school that we're trying to get started uh we are certified through the state of california we're the only one in this area to have this particular opportunity. And we're also state certified electricians where we can hire our students and put them to work immediately. So is it a and school? Is, is it a school? Yes, it's a school. Is it after open. for high school graduates or with it high could school? Be anyone that's interested in becoming an electrician from 17 on up. Okay, that's and what, do, what's your phone number? Uh, three two three five five two. I'm sorry, three two three five five two one six nine nine one six nine nine. So that's D E A dash C A C A dot org. It's a school. No, D E I D E I dash C A C A dot org. And these are for folks who these are for youngsters who are interested in becoming an electrician, right? A target group actually are people that no one that are left behind, people coming out of uh, penitentiaries, foster kids that are actually aging out. And talk and about talk about the um, the opportunities for them, what the salary scale is, because electricians make pretty good money, don't they? Yes, we have a couple of students that we uh, put through one program, and they're working at LAX, and they're up like 120000 so the pay raise ranges between thirty to two hundred sixty-one thousand with those eighty different career opportunities. Mm -hmm. But these careers we're not part of because we don't know how to access this opportunity. Mm -hmm. But once you become a state certified electrician, mm -hmm. all these doors open. In order to become uh, to get into a training program, well, you have to get first 
be part of a state-approved school that offers the trainee ID card, 720-hour curriculum. And you are state-approved. Oh, yes, yes. Great. And then you have to acquire 8,000 hours on the job training. But do they, have to, do they have to pay for this school? Well, we're a nonprofit, and we're doing fundraising. And a lot of the students that we're, our target group really does not have the money to pay. Mm -hmm. And we have the facility. Uh, we just need the training equipment. And our focus is maintenance and manufacturing because there is so much opportunity in manufacturing. And we say electrician, mm -hmm. first thing we think of is construction. Excellent but jobs, though. So many Excellent other jobs. opportunities. But you're not up and running yet. No, I've been, I've been, well, we've been working this since 2008. What happened, we started up, worked two years, and we decided that we wanted to get state approved. And that was a two-year process. So we had to go from a 16-week program to an 11-month program, 90-hour program to a 120-hour program, and the guidelines were based on the state curriculum. So we had to shut down, and I've been working this ever since, trying to get restarted because we feel with the right equipment. Well, Jenny has a solution for you. Tell them, Jenny. Okay, well, it's, it's kind of a long-term solution, but it's very far-reaching. And this is the kind of thing that when we talk about um, blacks and Hispanics and poor kids and struggling kids all over this country, um, that the failure of those public schools, the failure of those kids, you know, like half black kids, by the way, in the inner cities drop out of high school, uh, you know, and, and then they hit the streets and they don't have fathers at home and they don't, they, they, they can't get jobs and they can't read and write. They end up in crime or gangs or whatever. They end up in prison. And then what does the left say? Racism. As usual, no, it's not racism. It's because we have failed them since they were five years old. And by the way, Head Start doesn't work. Head Start is just nothing more than a great big babysitting program, federally funded babysitting program. But 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 Republicans, there's a Republican by the name of John Kruger who has an amazing idea that he that he wants to prevent. He wants to get on the ballot in 2020, and school choice and the Janus decision is going to make all this possible. Okay, so basically what he is saying is he wants all the funding that we get that that the Cal Sacramento claims they pay per student per year on education. Half our budget goes for education. He wants all that money, sixteen thousand dollars a year, to go to the parents instead of these failing horrible public schools. With the with the worst teachers in the country, although most of them are fine, but they're but the the, the poorest people and and minorities end up getting the, the 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 shaft. And so he wants all this money to go to the parents, and they can spend that sixteen thousand dollars per student per year on any school they want to, including a trade school like this gentleman was talking about. And that's a wonderful thing. And it yeah. would be amazing because then it's sixteen thousand dollars a year. Okay, that we've got two more minutes. So yeah, that's okay. One one more thing I would like to add to that, and I appreciate that information. But this is an opportunity for a group of black people, like-minded people, to get together, fund this school, and this would be something that we own to the point where we can hire. Our uh, you own know, Doctor Umar Johnson talked tried to be talking about black folks funding a school for about what? How many years now? That's not going to happen. We don't do it. We don't have the money. We can't afford it. I mean, not to be negative, but I know, um, you know, Umar Johnson was talking about funding a school. I think people send them money and so on and so forth, but then the school never got funded. Do you understand? So we can't no, talk. No, 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 no. I, I understand what you're saying, but if we had the right people. Yeah, but if, 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 to... if, 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 you know, we got to deal with what is. We always yeah. wishing and hoping on stuff. We got to deal with reality. If this, if that, you know, if my cousin, if my mother was my brother, you know, that kind of talk. Okay. No, <laughs> anyway, I, I we have one, I... we have one more minute. Anyway, thank you, T.O., for calling in. I'm Kathleen Wells. This is the Neck of Truth Report. Uh, we've had Jenny San, my VIP in studio guest. We're talking about school choice. This is what we're talking about, right, Jenny? We're talking about school choice and we're talking about school funding. We're okay, that's it. Uh, also, I want to remind my folks to go to the, the uh, town hall, which is <laughs> September 16th. Uh, I'm going to be there, and I'm going to have a pre-recording of my interview with Epic Times, which is a new sponsor. So please come to the town hall on they the 16th. Thank you. We'll be back.
Uh, next week is a pre-recording interview with Epic Times, and then the week after that, we'll be at, be back. Thank you very much. This is Kathleen Wells, your Truth Warrior. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. I loved it. I loved it too.